Bible study this morning. And um, I pray it, uh, pray it'll be a blessing. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask for the gift of teaching. Lord, help me stand, Father, for where you've put me. Say what you want me to say. What time we all have left in this world, Father, may we stand before thee and be faithful for what you've called us to do, to do our duty, to shoulder our responsibility. Not live for this moment, not live for the temporal, but have our eye and our view on the eternal. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, we're going to get back into uh, what we talked about last week. In uh, Turn to Genesis 1-1, one, one, if you would. Get that in one hand and uh, John 1, 1 in the other. Gospel of John, chapter number 1, verse 1. And then uh, Genesis 1-1. One, one. All right. Now, in Genesis 1 1, the Word of God says, In the beginning, Bereshith bara, Elohim. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, in John chapter number 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. You'll notice the wording is identical in the beginning, in the beginning. Both of these books in the scripture refer back to the, uh, into the beginning, in the beginning. Uh, in John chapter number 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. He never had a beginning. That is, to, to me, that is absolutely essential. Uh, if you're going to be a Christian, you're going to have to believe that. If you don't believe that, you're not a Christian. You may believe Christian morality and principles and philosophy and blah, blah, and on it goes. But if you cannot accept the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty, then you're not a Christian. In the book of Genesis, chapter number 1, the scripture says, In the beginning, God, now the word for God here is Elohim, created the heaven and the earth. So the Bible makes no bones about the fact that it speaks in broad terms, sweeping statements about eternal things. And it does this because the Bible is the word of God. Now, before we get it back in our lesson today about uh, Islam, the eschatology of Muhammad, and the Christology of Muhammad, I want to read this for you. This came from the Friday Church News, the Way of Life website, uh, January the 15th, 2016. The heading is Draconian Laws Against Offending Transsexuals in New York City. Now, think about what I'm reading to you. The following is excerpted, excerpted from you could be fined $250,000. December 29, 2015, according to brand new rules that were just issued by the New York City Commission on Human Rights, you could potentially be fined $250,000 if you purposely offend someone that is transgender. Now meditate on that for a moment. Meditate on that for a moment. This includes such offenses as calling a transgender woman him when she wants to be called her or not allowing a transgender woman to use the women's bathroom. These guidelines are particularly focused on the behavior of landlords, employers, and businesses, but they will undoubtedly create a chilling effect on speech all throughout New York City. Needless to say, these new regulations will result in a flood of litigation as transgender individuals exercise their new rights. According to the New York City Commission on Human Rights, employers must now use an individual's preferred name, pronoun, and title when referring to that person. And some of the pronouns that were given as examples by the Commission were only recently introduced to the English language, and many people don't even know how to pronounce them. The following comes from the new guidelines. The, uh, it requires employers and covered entities to use an individual's preferred name, pronoun, and title. Miss, Mrs., regardless of the individual sex assigned at birth, anatomy, gender, medical history, appearance, or the sex indicated on the individual's identification. Most individuals and many transgender people use female 
or male pronouns and titles. Some transgender and gender nonconforming people prefer to use pronouns other than he, him, his, or her, or her, or hers, such as they, them, theirs, or Z, Z E, uh, forward slash H I R, and on it goes. Here's the bottom line, folks. This is New York City, of course, and uh, the mayor in New York is a is a progressive leftist liberal uh, Democrat, uh, De Blasio, and uh, you might want to add this to your uh, understanding of Mr. De Blasio. The police department despises him. And they turned their back on him when he appeared for a, a, some kind of a function in New York because of the way he's treated the police and uh, so forth. But here's, here's what's important for us. You are living in an insane culture. That's all the way I know to put it. It's insane. Because the words that you grew up and the definitions that you grew up and the, uh, all that you learned as a child now has been completely turned upside down. And what I see in this is the preview of what's coming. It's going to come, folks, if it may get here sooner than you think, that they will come in and take your pastor and put him in jail. That day is coming. And they will put him in jail when he refuses to march to their tune or use their, their language or offend someone or whatever other little trumped up Mickey Mouse charge they want to bring against him. But it all boils down to freedom of speech, the First Amendment, freedom of speech. If you let, if you let a terrorist, draconian, authoritative, autocratic government Take your freedom of speech away from you. You're finished. Because none of the rest of your freedoms mean a thing. If they can get your freedom of speech, your guns are next. And they're already working on your freedom of speech. They're already working on it. That's what political correctness is about. In the 1700s, when the United States had its revolution, we revolted against King George. France followed suit. They revolted against their monarchy, Louis the Sixteenth, and they created the uh, the common man's uh, assembly. There are four power bases in the world: first estate, second estate, third estate, fourth estate. First estate is the church. Second estate's nobility. Third estate, the landowner or the, or the people who own businesses or the workers or what have you. And then the fourth estate, as it stands right now, is the news media. The political correctness that you are being fed, day in, spoon fed, day in and day out, is coming from the educational establishment, it's coming from the government, and it's coming from the news media. These three forces combined together are giving you a constant dose of political correctness. In France, the first and second estate opposed the people having their own voice in the government. And the people said, enough of you and enough of your monarchy and enough of the elitist in France, enough of you. And they formed their own, uh, I forget what was national, something they had a term for it, National, what was the term? Do you remember? National Assembly. national Assembly. That's what it was, the National Assembly. They formed their own National Assembly, which meant anybody could come in there, any common man from the street, and have a representation and speak. And you know what they did? They did this against the first and second estate. And the reason the first and second estate did not want them to do that is because the first and second estate was outnumbered by the third estate. If Americans ever woke up, if they ever woke up, you outnumber the elite. You have enormous power. If you'll go to the polls and vote and do something that has some substance to it after you've done some serious praying about what you should do. I hate to see a country go to hell. I hate to see my country go down to the pits. I do. I mean, I get emotional about this. 
a one fine nation, one outstanding nation. I'm talking about a country, no country's ever been like this country, and yet to watch these devils destroy the fabric and foundation of this nation and to watch it go down the tubes because people are intimidated and afraid to go out and say something or do something about this, you can show that bunch of devils that you're not going to take it and you're not going to listen to them and that you want your freedom of speech because if, folks, you lose your freedom of speech, your Christianity's out the door. You understand that, don't you? Once they outlaw the preaching of the gospel, what are you going to preach when you come in here? <laughs> what are you going to sing when the government tells you? So, you know, I didn't mean to get into all that, but I, it's, it's, it's personal with me. It really is. It really is. I've had it up to here with these elitists. They're the ones who they think they know far better how you ought to live your life than you do. That's why they dictate every move that you make. And they come out with garbage like this up here in New York. And probably the vast majority of New Yorkers are adamantly opposed to this. Imagine if you had to pay $250,000 because you offended somebody. What does it take to offend? How relative is a statement like that? He offended me. And so I'm, you know, he's going to cost him $250,000. Who can pay $250,000? Most people's houses uh, 10 years ago didn't cost that much money. And they had to take a 30-year mortgage to pay it. And now you've got the situation like that. So what is it? It is preparing you for the Antichrist. He is an authoritarian dictator. And that's exactly what he intends to do. He is going to dictate now, uh, listen carefully to this article. This comes out of the sword of the Lord. While the United States and European nations are taking in Syrian refugees by the thousands, many Muslim nations who have plenty of wealth are refusing to take even one. Did CBS tell you that? They report all the news, they say. NBC, ABC, the New York Times says that they report all the news that's fit to be reported or all the news that is news. Did you get it from them? This came out of the sword of the Lord. Uh, here are some of the nations. Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, United Arab Emirates. These are wealthy, oil-rich nations over there. And they absolutely refused to take one single refugee. Now, Germany took a bunch of them. And you know what they did in New Year's in Germany? You know what happened over there in Germany in New Year's? They raped those women like they were, they were, like they were just uh, property. I mean, they violated those women. You know what's happened since then? They did it in the wrong country. That's Germany. That's Germany. That's not the Netherlands. You know what's happened? The German men are rising up and they're going after them and they're starting to march in the streets and they're starting to form their own alliances and they're telling, they're telling uh, 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 what's her name, Markal, Markal, the prime minister, they're, say, they're saying to her, you're done. You're bringing all these millions of refugees into Germany and you're going to overthrow our culture, change our nation like we've never, like, you know, it won't appear as it ever has before. You're finished. As soon as we can, we're going to replace you. But meantime, we're going to take care of the problem at hand. And they are. And of course, it, it leads to civil unrest. Do you know why you have civil unrest? You have civil unrest when the government, either because of stupidity or because of the one-worlders, gets so bad that the people can't live under it anymore. Remember, folks, you know, Americans have a tendency to get a little arrogant and proud. Remember, this nation was started in rebellion. <laughs> England didn't say, well, go ahead and we'll give you autonomy. Uh, you know, go ahead and form your own country. Oh, no, 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 no. They sent the greatest army in the world over here to fight us. We rebelled against King George. Third. 13, 13 colonies, 13, the number of rebellion, rebelled against King George and fought eight-year war and finally, uh, and, finally, and finally won it. A lot of it was just simply a war of attrition, but finally won it and won their independence. And so Americans need to remember where we came from. We, we were born and bred and lived out of rebellion. In other words, when you've had enough, you've had enough, you've had enough, you've had enough. And these Europeans are saying now the European Union is dead. Germany is saying enough of it. We're finished with you. 
You're not going to bring these, these, these people in here and they think, open your doors, give them a place to come to, and they rape your women. But anyway, that's the situation. Now look carefully at what's going on here. ISIS and their Muslim extremist psychophants plan for world dominion and Sharia to be the rule of law all over the earth. Their plan has been exposed and documented. Lest anyone believe the ISIS terrorist organization is made up of backward, low-tech barbarians, the Mirror and the Guardian are reporting on a newly released document containing the ISIS plan for world domination. Who's the Mirror and the Guardian? These are two mainline uh, newspapers out of Great Britain. And uh, starting with the establishment of their own nation, spreading from there, according to the Mirror, a document outlining how ISIS organizes the vast territory it controls has been unearthed, and the terror group is far more sophisticated than we feared. That brings us to eschatology. That brings us down to where we are now. That brings us to the point. Remember now, I told you that Muhammad, when he, now I was corrected this past week, a Muslim sent me an email, and he said, Muhammad did not write the Quran. He said it was written by his lieutenants. But where did it come from? It came from Muhammad. It came from Muhammad. And it came as supposedly from Gabriel, and then the Hadith is supposed to be the commentary on the Quran. What does that tell you? They're listening. <laughs> That's what it tells you. They're listening. So if I get out of line in here, they'll let me know if, if I don't present their side correctly. All right? Now, by the way, who wrote the Bible? Men, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, right? God wrote the Bible. He simply used a human instrument to pen the words down. They were inspired. Theos Neustos. God breathed every word of Scripture. All Scripture is given by Theos Neustos. All Scripture is given by inspiration, all scriptures given by God breathing from God. That's where scripture comes from. That's what makes it different. So uh, Mohammed uh, had the Old Testament in one hand, the New Testament in the other, and then he appealed to Gnostic gospels and the stuff that was written in the first century. Now here is a summation. I just found this. This is good of what I've been trying to say to you. And sometimes when somebody else says it, it puts it in a better context and perspective. You remember what I've told you before, the old axiom, and it's so good. If you won't use another man's brains, it's a good indication you don't have any of your own. <laughs> right? <laughs> now let's use this man's brains. Listen to this. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who believe... It, are being saved is the power of God. Now that's not the King James, but he's quoting 1 Corinthians 1.18. Now listen carefully. And they're saying, surely, he's quoting the Koran, surely we have killed the Messiah, Issa, son of Meriam, the apostle of Allah, and they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it appeared to them so, like Isa or Issa, and most surely those who differ therein are only in a doubt about it. They have no knowledge respecting it, but only follow a conjecture, and they killed him, not for sure. Now, this, of course, is supposed to be a quotation of the Quran, and the reference is Surah, S-U-R-A-H, 4, colon, 157. Now, this man here is quoting the Quran to, to, uh, to support the statement he's about to make. The man's name is Masood Mishi Yen. I'm sure I butchered his name. Uh, uh, Masood Mash, Masihian. Whatever, y'all can. I have no idea. <clears throat> and I'm certainly not trying to make fun of him. Go, what he says is good. Listen to this. The denial of Jesus' crucifixion in the Quran, the, the reference he just quoted, cannot be considered an originally and inherently Islamic doctrine targeting one of the fundamental tenets of Christianity. History testifies to the fact that certain heretical group, groups that came into existence in the early apostolic period and gained fame in the second century refused to believe in the reality of the crucifixion. Despite showing minor variations, adherents of such groups were known by the collective term Gnostics 
and contended that the crucified Messiah was but an optical illusion. Go back to the Koran. It appeared to them like he had been crucified from the Koran. <coughs> Some try to make the argument that the existence of certain believers denying Jesus crucifixion in the early era of Christianity is detrimental to the Christian faith. For some producers or followers of conspiracy theories may tend to regard the teachings of the heterodox Christian groups in the early days of the church as remnants of the major Islamic teachings supposedly delivered by Prophet Jesus. Actually, the false teachings of the Gnostic groups that deny the reality of Jesus' passion and death are one of the few heresies that Muslims delight in using to back up the charges of biblical corruption and of the so-called apostasy from the Islamic doctrines after Jesus' ascension. That's a heavy statement. Let's keep reading. To put it another way, some Muslims may refer to the rejection of the crucifixion in the early period of the church to validate and historicize their allegations concerning Jesus' crucifixion in the Koran. This is why it becomes crucial to analyze both the Gnostic and Islamic doctrines about Jesus' death and in order to evaluate the claim that Gnosticism inherited the denial of Christ's crucifixion from Islam. Well, they say it. Here's what all that means. That in the first century after Christ, the Gnostic and the Gnosticism is a broad thing. It's not just a Gnostic believes this. No, uh, one Gnostic believes one thing, another another, but they are general in their belief about certain things. But here's the bottom line. In the first century after Christ, first century, the, the orthodox canonical scripture written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the Apostle Paul and Peter and James and so forth, presented the Lord Jesus Christ, Judas Iscariot, the life of Christ and all, in a certain way, and they were in agreement in what they presented to the people. In agreement. The Gnostic Gospels, on the other hand, <clears throat> diverge greatly from what the, the Orthodox New Testament doctrine teaches. And when Muhammad wrote his Koran, we're talking about, when he, of course, as, as I was corrected, <coughs> excuse me, when his lieutenants wrote it, 600 and something A.D., that he appealed to the doctrines in the Gnostic Gospels. That's not hard to believe because the Gnostic Gospels are in agreement in so many places with what the Koran says about who the Lord Jesus Christ is, about the crucifixion, and things of that nature. Not hard to believe at all. What I'm trying to say to you is that the Christology, the doctrine of Mohammed as it relates to the Lord Jesus Christ, did not come from the New Testament. It did not come from the Old Testament. It came from the same source that the Gnostic Gospels came from because they are in agreement about the same thing, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you say something like that, ask yourself this question this morning. Why is it so different? Why was it so different in the first century after Christ? Why is it so different even to this day? Why is there such a difference between orthodoxy or the straight line teaching of the Word of God and what's being uh, as the other Jesus Issa, as they call him, and all of that. Why does it differ so much? When you go back and read the Gnostics, you'll find out that most of them teach that the man who died on the cross was not really the Lord Jesus Christ, that the spirit that came on him at baptism had already left him, and that this man on the cross was just a human being, just a human being. He wasn't God, all right? That's docetism. That's, a, that's one of the things they teach you in theology, all right? He wasn't really God. Now, this idea that the one who died on the cross was not really God and that only Godhood that Jesus ever had was some kind of a special anointing that came upon him, that he wasn't really God in the flesh, 
because a Gnostic cannot believe that God and flesh are synonymous. There's no way they can be the same, one and the same. Therefore, they deny the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ that God became flesh and dwelt among us. Mohammed teaches in the Quran that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah, virgin born. Remember, I told you all this, but he is not the Son of God. He teaches in there that, that, that no man on this earth could be the Son of God. He could, there's no way he could be God because God is a spirit being and there's no way that he could have a son. God is one. That's what they teach. And where does that come from? It comes from Gnosticism. It comes out of the first century. In other words, all of the stuff, all of the stuff about the Lord Jesus Christ that differs from the New Testament has its source in this Gnosticism and perversion that showed up in the first century after Christ. That's where it came from. It sure didn't come from God. God is not the source of confusion. If God inspired a Bible in your hand that says that the Lord Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh, He's not going to inspire in someone else's hand something that denies that. That's not going to work. He's not going to do it. So when I read in John chapter number 1 in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God and the Word was God. And then verse 13 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The New Testament is as clear as it can be. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. But even Bibles, even Bibles that are accepted as, as orthodox in many mainline Protestant churches have a, have a, you can see where Gnosticism has affected them. Has anybody got an NIV? Any, any Bible, any, new any translation apart from the King James in 1 Timothy 3.16, you know what it says? He who was manifest in the flesh. Is he who was manifested in the flesh as strong as God was manifest in the flesh? He who could be anything. Where do you think that came from? See what I mean? That it came from the same source where Islam gets its Christology. It came from Gnosticism. But where does Gnosticism come from? It goes all the way back to what I told you before when Plato talked about the monad, the demiurge, the emanation, Sophia, and all that stuff. You know, I hate to go through all that again. But the bottom line is, according to all of these cults, every one of them, the God of the Old Testament is a demiurge who is a created God who came into being because of something that happened with Sophia, and they don't agree with that, all of them, about exactly what happened. But he came into being from Sophia who created him, and he came into being, and he created all this Old Testament and, uh, and the creation as you know, but he doesn't know he's a created God. He's a petty, jealous, tribal God of Israel. Remember the Jew? How I told you that if you can make the Bible a racial thing and an ethnic thing and stick it on one race of people, then you can say, well, good night. What do you expect? They're going to make themselves look good. It's all about them projecting their own image and who they are. But the Bible is not about one race of people. And it's not about the Jewish people per se in the sense that it's all about them. The Bible is about man's fall from grace the curse of sin, the Redeemer prophesied, and the Redeemer showed up, and the Redeemer went to the cross, and He died and was buried and rose again the third day, and He's coming again. That's a message to all mankind. Go preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature. All right? It's not about just the Jew, and it's not, it's not all about the Jew. It's to the Gentile. The Jew makes no difference who you are. It makes no difference what color you are. It doesn't matter about your ethnic background, how much money you got. The Word of God is to every human being on the face of the earth. But in the first century after Christ, they could not accept the fact that the cross, and that is the central focal point of our faith. If you take the cross out of Christianity, quote unquote, all you got left then is a bunch of do's and don'ts and self-righteousness and, and good deeds and personal morality and, 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 uh, and in, like any other religion. And that's exactly what Muhammad did. 
He does not believe that his Messiah, the Jesus, the Issa of Islam, died on a cross. And this eschatology that I told you about the other day, the eschatology of Islam. And now remember this, the Shia and the Sunni don't agree on all points. And I have to generalize things because I don't want to get into all the details. I've read the details and it'll wear you out of all the different stuff involved in this. But here's the bottom line. They believe a Mahdi is coming. A Mahdi who is kind of like a, who's kind of like a redeemer. He's, a, he's, a, he's a, 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 a savior to them. He's coming and he's going to bring the world to heal to Islam. But he's also going to come with Issa. He's coming with Jesus, you call him. But he's not the Jesus of the New Testament because when Jesus comes, according to Islamic eschatology, he will come, he will show up, and he will preach that he is a Muslim and he will destroy the cross and, all, and cause all the world to, to come to heal or to fall before, uh, before uh, uh, as Muslims to submit to Islam. That's what it means. Islam means submission. A Muslim is one who submitted and is going to cause the whole world to do that. Now, that's their eschatology. Now, here's the, here's, here's the, little, uh, the little spin that I put on it last week, and I hope you might have done some thinking about it. Since our Lord Jesus Christ is to them not the true Christ, and their Christ to us is not the true Christ, which one is the true Christ? And what's going on with the Christ? They have this third part, this third part with their eschatology, and uh, here again, I'll butcher the word, but it's Dajjal or Dajjal or something like that, who's the Antichrist. Islam teaches that there is an Antichrist. Now, you've got to digest all this stuff for a minute. You know, I mean, you've got to take it in and think about it. You've got to remember this. When you get into this stuff, take that word semantics and hold it up in front of you and remember what it means. Semantics. That's a, that's a word that has powerful meaning in this. All right? When he says Christ and I say Christ, we're not talking about the same one. If he says Jesus and I say Jesus, we're not talking about the same Jesus. The Apostle Paul says, if any man come to you preaching another Jesus, another spirit, see, there is another Jesus and another spirit. All right. So we understand. We have to understand definition of terms. When I'm talking to someone, if I'm talking to a born-again believer and we're talking about the Lord Jesus, there's no doubt in my mind we're talking about the same one. But if I'm talking to a Muslim and I mention Jesus and he mentions Jesus and I've heard them say, oh, we believe in the same Jesus you do, not so. Not so. Not so. Let's be, let's be intellectually honest about this. Not so. The Jesus I believe in is God Almighty manifest in the flesh. The Jesus they believe in is a man who was anointed prophet who came to this world to, to fulfill the will of Allah and that he's coming again <coughs> to fulfill the will of Allah. That's all fine. That's what they want to believe. That's fine. That is not my Jesus. That's the difference. Now, when you, when you look at this, here's the question you have to ask yourself. You should be asking yourself right now. Then... We have a real conflict going on today between the world of Islam and the world of Christianity. There is a real conflict. The Brahman, Brahma, goes back thousands of years. Gautama Buddha came out of Brahma. Hinduism came out of a growth of Buddhism from Brahma. A, a mixture of both, Brahmism and Buddhism, produces what's called modern Hinduism. It traces its origins back thousands of years. It is ancient. If you want to find the root of something, if you want to find out the granddaddy, where did it start? I'm not interested in somebody's take on it today in 2015, mean anything. Where did this come from? And what did they believe in the source of it? Then I, go, I have to go back to Brahma. I have to go back to what they believed then. I have to go back to the source of truth. There are two lines in this world, only two, only two, only two. There are many variations of the one that came from Satan, many, but there's still just two. One is the truth of God, the truth of God, as you hear it spoken to Eve in the garden. The other is the lie of Satan, God doth know in the day you eat thereof. 
you shall be as gods. He offered Eve illumination. God offered Adam and Eve life. I have found it to be my experience that every time someone gets led astray and gets sucked off into this stuff, into these occult uh, uh, religions or, or, you know, peripheral, everything in the world, that for the most part, the basis that they are so proud of is the fact that they are enlightened now. They know so much more than you do. You're ignorant. They're enlightened. That's exactly what Illuminati means. The enlightened ones. And they believe that they are vastly superior to you. And that's why they've set in motion their one world agenda and they're not going to stop until they bring it to pass. And it'll make a difference how many people they have to kill. They're going to kill them. Whatever they have to do, they're going to do it. I read a thing the other day and it's almost impossible to believe and there's no way you can, you can verify it. But it said that the Rothschilds are worth $500 trillion. Now just think about that for a minute. That's a pile of money. I mean, if they got that kind of money, then, you know, one of them did say this, and uh, I, can, I can believe this. I forget if it's Maya Rothschild, I think, but I don't quote me on that. But in the 1800s, I think it's 16, 17, 1800s, he made this statement. It's not making a difference who your, who your president or who your king or your queen or the, or the governing uh, body of your, of your country is. He said, that means nothing to me. He said, you show me who controls the money, and I'll show you who controls the country. Yeah. You show me the money, and I'll show you the country. Don't you know there's a reason for the Federal Reserve, 1913, a reason for the income tax and all that? Don't you know there's a reason for the Internal Revenue Service, a terrorist organization? You know how I many people are dead right now because the Internal Revenue Service, what they did to them? You ought to read the book written by Hansen. I've got it in my library, To Harass Our People. He was a representative in, in the U.S. Congress about 25, 30 years ago. He wrote the book about the Internal Revenue Service. But come back to my point. Five hundred trillion dollars. You remember what I told you a trillion dollars was? If you spent a million dollars every day, every single day, one million dollars for the last 2,000 years. Every day, a million dollars for the last 2,000 years. You wouldn't get much over 800 billion. You wouldn't even get to a trillion. That gives you a perspective on how much a trillion dollars is, doesn't it? And uh, uh, Trump says that the United States is 20, 20 plus trillion dollars in debt. And they say that the debt of the United States since uh, Obama's gone into office has quadrupled. <laughs> that at the beginning of the, of, the, of the new millennium, 2000, 2001, the debt was about four to five trillion dollars. And now it has quadrupled since then. So what's that mean? That means that somebody is doing something with the money. The American dollar is on the verge of no longer being the reserve currency of the world. The reason your interest rates can remain low is because the American dollar is the reserved currency of the world. Before that, it was the British pound sterling. The reason it was the British pound sterling because the British Empire never saw the sun set on, on, on it under Queen Victoria. The British pound sterling was the world's currency. And then the United States emerged from World War II as a superpower. And the dollar bill has become the world's currency. Now China is moving, and I think Russia is moving, to try to take the American dollar from its position as the, as the uh, reserve currency of the world and replace it. What's that mean? That means that the interest rates in America, which have been held low, Yellen, if you will remember just a few days ago, raised at what, a quarter of a percent? something like that. Have you noticed the stock market in the beginning of 2016? Have you noticed it? For the first day or two, it was just cause for concern. Now they are saying that it's very possible that our country could be headed for another recession just like the one in 2008. That the stock market is down, I think, over 500 points. That it's nosediving and Monday, tomorrow, 
would normally be a stock market day, but it's a national holiday. So it's going to be Tuesday before they see what happens when they open the doors. The American monetary system, if they can control it, they will control you. They can bring America to heal through your dollar bill. If you are worth $500 trillion, you can buy and sell any country you want to. If you got that kind of money. I'm not saying they do. But I, I'm saying I have read where, that the, uh, where the Rothschilds are supposed to have that kind of money. I don't, how, do you, how, do you, how do you verify something like that? Call them up and say, how much money in your bank? You know, let me know. I hear, I hear you got $500 trillion. Uh, well, you can't, you know, there's no way to, to, uh, to verify it. Uh, but you do. How many of you really believe that somebody out there is pulling, pulling purse strings? Or controlling the money? So how does Islam fit into this final scenario? How do they fit? Did you know that in Michigan, in Michigan, that they've got universities up there and colleges up there that are, they have certain areas set aside for Muslims to have prayer, prayer rooms, this, that, so forth and so on, but nothing for Christians? It seems to me like they are using the conflict between the Muslim and the rest of the world to create the chaos they want. I believe it's all fabricated. I really do. I believe it's fabricated. I believe the Hegelian dialect is a real, is a real reality. All right? Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. You've got a situation where they want to change it. So they put you in a situation where you can't live it. You can't stand it. They, get, they give you a taste of it. Then they give you an alternative to it. And the alternative is the synthesis. That's what they wanted to begin with. All right. So all I can say to you this morning is to watch and see how much that agitation is produced and uh, try my best to teach you like I have to show you the difference between uh, Islamic eschatology and the eschatology of the New Testament. There's a vast difference between the two. Do you know what the eschatology of the New Testament is? Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And the Lord Jesus Christ is coming because of a mystery that was revealed to the Apostle Paul. And when he comes, he's coming for his bride. And he's going to catch his bride out of this world. And then the Bible says such a time of deception the world has never known. And that time of deception is at our doorstep. And we are ready to leave out of this world. That deception is coming. How many of you have heard any of this stuff on, on YouTube, you don't hear much of it. How many of you have heard these sounds? A few of you. These sounds. Now, you know, if it was just one local sound, it'd be some nut over here in the garage creating some kind of a thing, screaming, going on, you know. But it's all over the world. These sounds. Yes, sir. Yeah, the cannon fire is the latest. Yeah. Booms, cannon, cannon booms. This stuff is going on all over the world. It sounds like gigantic trumpets going off for, for a long period of time. It sounds like stuff that you've never heard before. What you do, you know, you don't deny the existence of this stuff. You try to make sense out of it. Could be the groaning. Could be the what? Groaning. groaning. Oh, the groaning, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the birth pangs over there in, in Matthew 24, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but just get on the internet and Google uh, strange sounds and noises. They're everywhere. I don't know, I'm not saying at all that I know what it is, but I'm saying it is, it is, it is. Depending on what the word is means, you know, it is. <laughs> yes, sir. I thought there's somebody raised their hand back there. <coughs> I need my glasses on. I can't see but 20 feet. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. But their God incarnated in flesh still wouldn't be our Jesus because their God is all. 
Yeah, but their God never incarnated in flesh. Well, that's true. I mean, there are those who say it's just a generic term that Allah is uh, a, a term for God. But there's uh, quite a bit of study that's been done on that, and they say Allah is Allah. But he's not Jehovah. Yeah, one, They're not the same. <laughs> one part of the scriptures it just says that Jesus Christ was the Son of God because God had no son. And then it goes on and says that there's no Holy Spirit. And then Muhammad claims to be the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I mean, the book is just a, a radical bunch of garbage. Yeah. Yes, sir. Very interesting point. <laughs> you can't promote the Almighty. <laughs> yes, sir. He plays big time. He plays big time. I believe Glenn Beck got kicked off of Fox because he started opening up way too much about Soros and about uh, the inner workings of this. Uh, Soros has, has, uh, has channeled millions of dollars into the destruction of this country. No question about it. No question about it. Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Spirit of error? Uh huh. Yes, sir. And then they receive not the love of the truth. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very important. Yeah. This is the condemnation. Light has come to the world. Men love darkness rather than light. Yes, sir. All right. Okay, we'll have a word of prayer and let you go. We've run out of time. Amen. We'll get back into it next week, Lord willing. Brother Ronnie Crane, will you dismiss us?